D. We're two divorced. Well, I'm still separated. Okay. Working parents. <laughs> we talk about all the things you get to deal with when your marriage ends. Like co-parenting, dating, running a household all by yourself. How early is too early for a good hard drink? <laughs> or a glass of wine. <laughs> and how do you keep it all together after everything fell apart? This is The Married Life. Life. Hey, you. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Hello. This is my friend Dee. Dee, this oh, is sorry. my friend Patrice. It's my daughter's name showing up again. I don't know why this keeps happening. I'm not Nova. My name's Dee. <laughs> hey, yeah. Dee. How's my, daughter, my daughter had one karate class one time on Zoom. And for some reason, her name shows up now every time I try to sign in. I'm going to end this once Oh, my girl. God. You know what I want to do is have that filter that turns me into a cat that was awesome <laughs> oh, did you see that thing are you referring yeah, it, to the, yeah it's so yes. funny so funny i know i'm not really a cat i'm not yeah really i'm, I'm not actually a cat i have a dog that is normal she's 13 she normally lays right here during podcasts and pants but my boyfriend's down the hall and has her so i'm waiting <laughs> I thought you for said she lays down during the podcast in pants <laughs> <laughs> and pants she <laughs> no i make her she wear pants. An outfit. It's pants i make her wear leather pants jeggings and no shirt. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Awesome. I just say I saw an 80 year old lady today, like walking 80 ish year old lady walking down the street in leather, leather, leather pants. And oh, I was I love like, that. good for you, lady. And that's good not for you. a good look on anybody. <laughs> I feel if you're over 80, anything You can goes. wear anything. You could wear a tarp and it would be hot. You know? Yeah. My, sure. friend's, my friend's grandma wore leather pants to her 90th birthday party with like skate shoes. She looked great. It's just for me. I don't know. Maybe I'm too obsessed with this, but I just feel like the leather pants make your ass the size of like a watermelon. Like they're giant in leather pants, your ass, regardless if you have a great ass or not. Yeah. It's, it's not a good ass pant. <laughs> no, you're right. It true. Isn't. And if you don't have a perky butt, if your bum is like a bit on the flat side, like mine, it also doesn't do you any favors because it sort of flattens it even more. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> So if you have a big the butt, it makes ass. your butt bigger. Yeah. If you have a pancake butt, it makes it even more pancakey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, on this note, I'm going to do the formal introduction now. Now that we've done the ass conversation, I mean, all the important stuff is covered. We might as well just stop now, really. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Patrice. Today, we are here with Patrice Mousseau, the founder and CEO of Satya Organics which is an amazing company born of necessity and thriving and surviving because it's just so freaking awesome. I am a huge fan and I will tell you the many ways I use your product and you might want to wish you could unhear it, but you can't. Welcome, Patrice. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Does this have anything to do with a Bego? <laughs> <laughs> do you know a Bego, Patrice? Of course. I know. Yeah. I, yeah, Tony. Yeah. We have a thread. We haven't actually met Tony yet, but we've got a whole thread going where we think there's an opportunity in the condom market for a Bego. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> is this like freshness wrapping what's going on freshness wrapping for sex and we just have a theory about full coverage anyway we digress <laughs> i'm sorry i couldn't help it i gotta hear more so i can tell tony oh my god yeah basically there's a thread arising in the podcast and she's gonna have to come on and learn some <laughs> some ideas she's gonna have to do some myth busting <laughs> Here's why that won't work, ladies. Here's why. <laughs> Love it. But today, it's all about you. And we're so grateful to have you here with us. So thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. God thank knows you. I got, you got nothing but time available on your hands, right? <laughs> right, right, well, right. You know what? Uh, you got me at like the perfect time, actually, because as my little girl, she's with her dad uh, tonight. And I was just sitting around reading a book. I was taking a book vacation because we oh, can't take so actual vacations. Yes. Where'd you um, go? I went to my bed but and I had a book. book. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go somewhere in your mind? I will like put on Italian music and eat spaghetti and pretend I'm in Italy. So that's my vacation. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And a book. Okay. So the book wasn't like particularly fun, but I'm speaking at Shio tomorrow about decolonizing your business. Yes. And I wanted to sort of hear some outside words of wisdom. So I, there's this book that was recommended to me called Decolonizing Wealth, which 
is really good, but just about as fun as you think it sounds like. It's not it's not a bodice ripper by any means, but um, <laughs> it would be awesome if they somehow incorporated those two things. I think that's no. what's missing. Let's decolonize my bodice, you know, <laughs> get in there. <laughs> I just in yeah, a consensual just make it accessible way, of course. for everyone in yeah. a consensual way, but yeah, make totally. It, you know, you can <laughs> expand your expand your world and your. Um, I don't know what I could. I could. I know what I could say, but I'm not going to say it. Expand oh, other things. Damn so, it! Yeah. We'll, we'll work on you. So, okay. Patrice, I know you've said it a million times. Well, first of all, th- let's start here. I was trying to remember when we first exactly met because I know we met at a social venture institute and Hollyhock in at Cortez Island in BC, which is for socially conscious business people to come together. I remember the party on the last night and you and I were both throwing down on the dance floor. And that, I don't know if you remember, but I remember it's like, I like her. <laughs> I like her style. And then we were talking, there was a group talking outside, but that's when I first like really, really got really met you. And I'm like, okay, I like this human being. And so here we are like six years later and still, I just love the world. Mine was actually before that, because I don't know if you remember, but do you remember when you did the intro, everybody had to do those revolving intros in front of the oh, stage no. and everyone, and you did a cheer. <laughs> you brought out your cheerleading, like, yeah, I thought it was just the funniest thing. It was awesome. Like you were, you were the bomb. So, so it was all was movement, like, yeah, movement related. Cliche. None of it super fancy or good, but it's <laughs> no. <laughs> and but I, it was, no one, you were, you were putting it out there. It was awesome. I did that. I did do a cheerleading dance. I did a cheerleading dance because it was like 10 or 20 years after I'd actually done it. And I did it because I wanted to stand out because everyone was saying all these amazing things and I wanted to stand out. So that's what happened. And you see, did. Look, so make an ass of yourself. Sometimes it pays off and you meet really that's cool right. people. So there you go. Yep. So you were um, awesome. <laughs> so moving on, I can't wait to shake asses, at, you know, like together. I think that's going to be a thing, like when we all get to to go dancing together. Tell us the story of Satya, how how it came to be and why. Let's start there. Okay, so basic cold notes. Um, my background's in journalism. I was a radio and television broadcaster for many, many years. Got pregnant. World changed because now I'm a mom. Um, and then my little girl developed eczema, the doctor's only option was steroids. And so, you know, I just thought that that was not acceptable for my eight month old baby. Um, I knew how to research. Uh, so I started looking at, um, you know, medical research, existing academic studies, traditional medicine, made something in my crock pot based on all that research and cleared her eczema up in two days. Um, I ended up, you know, sharing with a bunch of people and it wasn't until much later that I actually decided to make a business because I, I had the good fortune to expose, be exposed to some other women in business who were doing it with doing it, doing business with integrity and values and like quite successful, but at the same time, not screwing anybody over, uh, while they were doing it. In fact, trying to make the world a better place which super resonated with me because that's actually why I got involved in media in the first place, right? I just, I wanted to affect change, good change. So I thought, okay, awesome. I, then maybe I can get behind this because my, my perception, my stereotypical perception of business was not great, but I saw it could be different. So I got my product organically certified. Um, and then I submitted it into health Canada uh, for review, so I could actually make the health claims uh, around it being an anti-inflammatory for skin issues like eczema, and then did my first farmers market in Port Moody, um, where I sold one hundred and ten dollars, which was awesome. So fun! That first money is the best money, yes. I think. Yeah, yeah, it was great, and it was funny actually. The one of the people I met that day has since uh, she's now my bookkeeper. Uh, we were separated for many, many years and we were like, oh my God, like you were there the day I started. Uh, and then, yeah, we went, I ended up going to a local store. She wouldn't carry my product because she already had a million ones. I was able to uh, clear up the rash on her ring finger. She ended up, you know, carrying my product. We went from 70 store up to 70 stores in the lower mainland in the lower mainland of Vancouver. And then Whole Foods wanted to start carrying the product. 
And then I was like, okay, that's awesome, but I'm still making it in my crock pot. Like, if you can give me some time to kind of like scale up, which they were very cool and they did. And we went from 70 stores to 400 stores in two months after wow. I had the go. That's them. wild. Yeah. Um, and then we ended up in a, just with the distributor, um, Purity Life. And now we're in, I'd say 900 stores across Canada and, um, and expanding. So we're actually looking at, uh, we're just getting all our ducks in a row to potentially uh, launch into the US. So, yeah. So is that the sales strategy initially? You said she had a rash on her finger. You just like scan the person that you're looking at. You're like, where's the rash? Where's the itch? Where can I slap this on and prove it to you? Well, because it's such as skin issues are so prevalent. Um, like just eczema alone, I'm not talking about psoriasis or rash or contact dermatitis, all that stuff, just eczema alone. It's about 20% of the world's population in particular for kids. Right. So, and, and there's, it's not just a physical malady. It's also like the emotional, um, aspects of it. Like some of it can be really just devastating to people because they don't want, they feel ashamed if they have it on their face, they don't want to shake people's hands. I, I just know that it's very, very prevalent, more so, uh, I think, than most people know. It's because they're always wearing long sleeves. I was one of those kids. You just wear long sleeves because if you don't, then kid, people ask you what's wrong with your arms. And then as a young adult, too, just having like, you know, bloody <laughs> elbows, people think you're like, you know, injecting drugs or they think you're gross or yeah. And so then you end up wearing long sleeves in the summer, which makes you hot, which makes the eczema w- way, way Even worse, worse, as you, as you yeah. know. It's not really a disease per se. It's more of a symptom of an underlying issue. And finding out what that underlying issue is, is very difficult and what that trigger is. And it takes time. And sometimes even after you figure it out, your body has changed and now it's coming at you for a different reason. So it's tough. That sounds really fun. I'm... Wow. <laughs> that just sounds like, oh, you fixed this? Okay, let's try this thing to take you down. It's so frustrating too, because you go to an allergist or an immunologist, and I'm speaking from experience, and they'll look at the rash and they'll say, oh, it's eczema. We don't really know why you have it or, um, you know, what, what to do about it, except we know it's linked to allergies. It's linked to asthma. It's linked to genetics. It's linked to food intolerances. It's linked Breathing to environmental air stuff. Causes yeah. It. yeah. So you're like, <laughs> yeah. okay, so all these links. So cool. So just remove all food, remove all environmental, everything. Yeah. Stop breathing. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, and take, take these steroids. Perfect. Okay. All right. I guess that's, guess that's the prescription. And quite, I mean, quite often the steroids, you know, they make it even, you know, worse. I'm not saying all steroids are bad, but overuse of steroids. And the doctors will tell you, use it for two, three weeks max, but that's not enough for people, right? So they build tolerance to it. So then they need a stronger steroid and then they try to go off it and they end up with, you know, just their whole body system breaks down. So we needed more than just that one solution. Um, which was, of course, steroids, but now, but now there's something else out there uh, that I created for my little girl that I just wanted to share with people. I was curious because when when um, Erin was mentioning bringing you on the show, she said that you're a single mom and you just mentioned that your daughter spends time at her dad's place. And I was curious to know what your marriage situation was when you started the business. Is this something that happened after you, know, after you were single or is this something that sort of came about when you were still married? No, it, well, I wasn't, we were never married, uh, per se, common law. It's all the same to us. It's all the same same to us. It's Mm -hmm. the same. It's it's something I started when um, we were still together. And I mean, we weren't together too, too much longer after that. But the business has supported me from the get go. Um, That's huge. Yeah, it was super huge. So I guess my, my sort of follow up question to that was how, how did the experience of of separating from a partner or your partner influence your feelings and your decisions around your business? Because obviously, I mean, I can imagine that would be a, a bit of a scary or intimidating prospect going into business for yourself um, and then potentially knowing that you might be doing, you might be needing to support a little family all by, all by yourself. <laughs> well, I'm great at car, uh, compartmentalization. So if I looked at it and goes, oh my God, like I have to make this work for myself. 
Um, otherwise, I have nothing. I would have been terrifying, and I probably wouldn't have been. I probably would have been paralyzed. Um, and it did flick up here and there, but mostly I just tried not to look at it. And I don't know. That's not really a great coping strategy, ignoring reality. But that's really how I did it. I think they call just, that avoidance. I just kind of, and I just kind of I do assumed. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of assumed things would work out. I kind mm. of like I I I just I just wanted to keep doing what I was doing because it was making a difference to people too, and it felt good. Like it felt like the right thing to be doing. Um, I've always been sort of a more creative thinker, like problem solver. Like, what if we do this or do that? And this really gave me the opportunity to like fully flex that pers- part of my personality. Um, so, yeah, I didn't think about failure being being something that was going to happen, but it, it really wasn't much of an option either. How soon after you uh, you realized this formula that you developed in your crop, but you, you cleared up your daughter's eczema in two days, how soon before you started sharing what you learned with others around you? And then, you know, how did that kind of then lead to dawning on you? Like I could make, I can make something out of this. Like I said, I, I created this in my crock pot and I cleared my daughter's eczema up in like two days, but I still had a whole crock pot full. Right. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this? So I was on uh, my mom, mom and baby Facebook group. And I asked like, does anybody need any? And I had to make like more crock pots. Like it was crazy. I had people, I was living in the interior of BC at the time in Elkford. And I had people driving, um, you know, from two towns over just to come and try, uh, try my product. Cause at that point also, like, I didn't know how, like I said, how prevalent this issue was and how painful it was physically and, and emotionally. But I did know what it was like for me as a mom and to have my baby in pain, to having her scratching so hard that she's leaving blood on, on the crib sheets, you know, and just, it just kicks you in the gut. And you'll do anything. You'll drive that far to get whatever's in that crock pot. Yeah. 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 And luckily, I mean, so many people are like, I need more of this. This is amazing. It's working so well, but yeah, I really didn't think of it as being a business, like a, proper full business. Like I, I I think I was, you know, my first, my first containers, I was literally writing on construction paper and gluing it to little jars. So people knew what was in it. Right. And then they could take it home, but that wasn't really a a business (laughs) person. It was just kind of getting enough money to, to make more. But that is the start. That's it. Like that's what kept you going. Right. When did you, Yeah. yeah. When did it occur to you or, or how did it occur to you to take it to the next level? Well, it was, it was meeting, meeting these women who were doing business, um, at this SVI conference, actually the, I guess it was the year or two before I met Aaron, um, and seeing people like, uh, Madeline Shaw and Suzanne Siemens from Lunapads, uh, meeting the ladies from nature's path, you know, they were just, it was just really inspirational to be around these women who were just, you know, making it work and without, doing harm to anybody. So trying to do good in the world. I liked it. Yeah. Cause that's, that's the thing. There's, they're starting a business and starting a, a socially conscious business are two very different things. But I think, um, as a parent, there's sort of that additional layer of like, okay, wait a second, what is my tread on this planet that I'm, I I'm supporting you with, but what am I also leaving behind? So I heard, I saw on your site, your video um, with the plastic bank. Can you tell us a bit about that? You have the jar, you saw yeah. the jar and people have been asking me for a long time that they wanted a stick version. So they didn't have to stick their finger or their coffee Starbucks. stick in, yeah. in it. Right. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, they want an alternative to this jar. So I was looking at different, you know, the, the existing, um, biodegradable plastics that were out there and, um, they were, um, they broke down into microplastics. Um, then I looked at paper and the oils in my product made it fall apart. The lid came off. Like I just tried all these different things. It took me a long time, but I was like, I had nothing. There was no good version that I wanted to put out in the world. And then I thought, well, what if we got a really high quality recyclable plastic and made it refillable? So you could technically recycle it if you pull the mechanism out. But the idea is not to recycle it. The idea is to keep it and just refill it 
And so we created these, I don't have one in front of me, like these little refill pouches that are made with non-GMO corn and wood fiber. They look like plastic, but they're actually compostable. So you can, um, you get the refill, you, you know, scrape it out, squeeze it out, whatever you want to do, you melt it, and then you pour it back into these containers. So you can use, keep using it. But yeah, then I was like, well, we're still making plastic. So how do we, uh, how do we do better with that? And so I researched, right? Cause that's, I love, re- I, that's what I do. I research and I found, um, there's only about three companies that I, I know of in the world that do plastic offsets. Um, one of them is this company called the plastic bank and they normally work with big, large multinationals like Procter and Gamble and Henkel. Um, and when I called them, I could not get anybody on the phone at all. And luckily I knew somebody who knew somebody because they're actually based in Vancouver, uh, I had the opportunity to talk to the president over coffee and basically convinced him that they should be allowing Satya into this program. And the program itself, what it means is that whenever somebody buys one of my sticks, um, we're paying someone in a developing country to go to their waterways, pull the plastic out and take it to their local plastic bank depot and exchange it for credits for medical care, educational tuition, or household items. And then the plastic they've brought in gets recycled using this really special process that basically recycles everything. And then it's purchased by these companies like Procter & Gamble and Henkel at a premium, and it's called social plastic. So it is recyclable plastic, but it actually is doing good in the world. So I I thought it was a great program and uh, wanted to be a part of it. So that's why we were part of the plastic bank. That's so cool. And what I'm thinking now is like, at any point in your journey to now, was there an option to sort of like take the path of least resistance, the easy path, the cheap path, the profitable path? Oh, Patrice, you're going to be a cajillionaire. Just give up your values and and poison the planet. (laughs) Yes, there's always a cheap option out there. And it's, you know, it's hard to say to people who aren't paying themselves, like you need to pay a premium for, you know, really responsible packaging. Um, but now, you know, the technology is getting so good that we're, it's, it's starting to get to the point where we're at parity with a lot of stuff. Um, so I feel like if you just make the effort, um, you can just do a little bit better and just keep like, we're constantly evolving we're not perfect by any means. I mean, we try our best, but as new things come up and new, you know, advancements are made, we constantly try to evolve and become better. And I think that's what anybody in any company and corporation should always be trying to do is just go, you know what, the status quo isn't good enough. I I think we need to try and see if we can do better. So one, one trend that I, I also love research, um, and one trend that I've been looking into, (laughs) yeah, we're all, we're all sort of, uh, research wonks. Is that a polite term? <laughs> um, <laughs> so the amount of, okay, so we know two, two things coming out of the pandemic, lots of, lots of stuff coming out of it. But one, one thing is a lot of marriages are ending. Maybe they needed to, maybe they didn't. I don't know. I think probably they did need to, but they're ending. And another thing being people starting their own businesses because either they've been laid off or they sort of realize like, if not now, when, and so for, for women and men who are coming out of a relationship where you've had that other partner to sort of help prop you up, whether that be emotionally, spiritually, financially, whatever it might be. Uh, what would you say to those people? Because starting a business is daunting at the best of times. But when you don't have someone who's going to pay the bills for you and take care of all that sort of day to day logistics, and it's all the stakes you, are so much higher. It's so high. So how do you how do you do that? For me, being, um, and this is true with any like major relationship that I have been in, I have been married and this was true of my, of my marriage as well. It's incredibly liberating and kind of awesome to not be dealing with a toxic relationship in your life. You no longer have to think about arguing with somebody about decision-making or household care, whatever, like it's just gone right? It's, it's actually really getting rid of a burden to me. Yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. It can free up a lot of time that you would otherwise be investing in 
at a, you know, something who took out the garbage, yeah. who didn't take yeah. out the garbage. Well, and I think also people feel like they should feel bad or scared that, you know, that cause they're going to be on their own. But the reality is, is that I think we can all take care of ourselves pretty damn well. In fact, we've probably been taking care of our partners and the kids and the house and the work and everything all on our own. And so this is actually going to be easier. So I don't, I mean, I don't really say I'm sorry. I kind of say congratulations because it's probably been a long time coming too. So who's your sounding board then? You know, I hear a lot of people who are married or, or partnered up saying, you know, they rely on their partner so much to talk through their kind of work stuff when they get home. And who is that person for you? Well, it's definitely my, you know, my friends, uh, my people who are in the entrepreneurship uh, world because they really understand it. Um, more than like, there's a, you know, it's a shorthand, right? Like they get it and you can can talk about capital and equity and, you know, all these shares and stuff, and they understand what you're talking about. Whereas just because someone shares your bed doesn't mean they share your experience. They might even give you the wrong advice, given that they're obviously biased. Should I borrow another hundred thousand to uh, (laughs) this other market? No, I don't think you should. I don't think that's a good idea. (laughs) I mean, more often than not, I hear from other entrepreneurs that, you know, their husbands are saying, well, why don't you just get a real job, you know? And that's so kind of damaging. And then if you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't really understand what's going on and you feel like you should be able to talk to them, then that can be also incredibly lonely, Mm -hmm. right? Like I don't put that, I would never put that burden on my partner. I would go to people who I know have that, um, partners are for other stuff, you know? Um, but yeah, you know, it's complex. It's not black and white. Like I, I would love to be able to also discuss stuff, you know, in bed, like that's great. But I, I have these amazing friends who are around me that I can, you know, honestly talk to anytime. That's why it's so important to have community as an entrepreneur. Um, it's not, it's not about networking. It's about community and, and it's connecting about the people who are there. Yeah. yeah who yeah. got your back. Right. Yeah. Cause that's one of the things that it's that idea, that idea of that one person completing you and one person will be all things and they'll be your best friend and your lover and your advisor and your therapist. We expect a lot. We seem to expect a lot from our partners or some, some people do. We don't want to be that. We don't, we shouldn't want to find that. So the idea that to try to put that burden on one human being and receive that burden, as you're talking about, like it, it frees up a lot of time, not having to be that person, but then also not expect someone. But there are so many ways for us to connect now and find those communities of, of female entrepreneurs, male entrepreneurs, pe- anyone, any shape, way, form, people trying to do business. And I think that idea of, yeah, it's not about having one, one person that is your, you know, holy grail. It's about having a diversity of opinions that you can, with people who are out in the trenches doing the same thing you're doing, you know, in a different way. Yeah. And I mean, you're sharing resources, you're just tears, you know, it's just having that vulnerability with other people, uh, which is incredible. Like when COVID hit, I was on the phone three times a week with my, you know, my family of uh, women who that are on this entrepreneurship uh, journey and run businesses like, and they really got me through. And I'm sure your business was on the uptick with all the stress hives that were uh, break, breaking out. <laughs> At least they broke out for me and in, in a pretty major way, more than once. Mm-hmm. Stress hives and a lot of frontline workers were using our products. On their hands and stuff? Or? Yeah. Anybody who's washing their hands. But um, this, I remember in particular, this one woman, uh, she's a nurse. And she was saying that um, her hands were so bad that she had to use crazy glue to glue them together while she was on shift. Because otherwise she'd bleed all over whatever she was touching. Yeah, or whoever. Um, yeah. So, so she was able to use Satya, and it got her hands back to the point where her fingerprints had actually started to grow back, and she could use um, the bio scans again because she couldn't do that before because her hands were in such bad shape. She had no more fingerprints. So, yeah, it's been really good. We actually right now we're donating. Um, I think it's two hundred and thirty uh, sticks of our of our like our Satya product to, um, extended care, uh, extended care facility here in BC and one in Ontario. Um, just because like 
these guys have really been um, through the ringer, right? And we want to help them any way we can. So we had, um, we gave the opportunity for our customers to donate at half price and we matched every donation as well. Cool. God damn, Patrice. <laughs> it's just so many layers of That's awesome. Like, do you ever just, mm-hmm. you take your halo off at the end of the night, and you're just like, wow, that was oh, heavy. <laughs> But that's like a lot. That's a lot. Because I mean, there are, there are, you know, a lot of other, you know, ways of doing it. And you're choosing that path. And that's amazing. And yes, these people deserve to not not be bleeding on their patients. Like it's the least we could do, right? But the fact that, you know, business can be a force for good and step in and fill those gaps that are left um, by government or big business or whatever it might be. I mean, that's amazing. It's super cool. I do not have a halo. I am... Far I'm going to make you your one. bookcase is illuminating <laughs> you in a very angelic, ethereal way. <laughs> I mean, in a good way. I know you're a badass too. I know. I know that you get up to no good. I'm just trying to not be an asshole. You know, like I just, I think that that's what we should all just. It's just shame that that requires effort. It does require effort as humanity to like not be an asshole because being the asshole is often the easy available choice most of the time. I think the one thing that I do, which not everybody does, I mean, certainly not the assholes, but, um, is I, I constantly ask if I'm being an asshole or can I do better? Or, you know, like I question things and I think a lot of people don't. And so they just like, Oh, like they just miss it or they get too involved and, you know, other their own assholes versus being self-aware. Yep. So how old is your daughter now? She's nine. Nine. So you've been doing this, I guess, about nine years now. Well, she developed it when she was eight months. And then it took me a while, like I said, to actually um, do the farmer's market. So that was really, I started it in 2014. uh, And then like, like the farmer's markets. And then 2000, the very last day of 2015, I incorporated. So we've been a incorporated business for God, six years now, I guess. So she must be pretty, she must be pretty proud of what you do. Like what, how, you know, how does she describe you to her friends? She tells the boys, you know, like, cause they tell her that girls can't be bosses. And she says that, no, my mommy is the boss of everything. <laughs> <laughs> Don't never correct her. Never. <laughs> right. Um, and she is, um, you know, she can get up on a, on a chair and talk about Satya uh, to, to anybody like she's very confident um, and she just, she's curious about everything. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of her. In fact, I try whenever I get the opportunity, like if I'm, if I'm speaking like on stage or whatever um, or on a panel, I, I try to bring her up as well because I want her to know that her voice is important and it's no, my voice and her voice. Like we're all, even though they grew up on that, little stage or whatever we're all we all have a voice and hers is important too so yeah I'm just trying to to role model for her so that she can go out and do good in the world too how do you carry that into the world because I know you're not just an amazing female leader business leader but this amazing daughter you are two also indigenous women going out in the world doing good what is it like when you're speaking with, with, with your community, your indigenous community and beyond representing that part of you. When I'm in the indigenous community, I feel light and at home and full of laughter. Like I just feel great. Um, it's like going home, right? Mm -hmm. As it should be. When I'm not in the indigenous community and, you know, I'm asked to represent the indigenous community, which is, um, which is a lot. I mean, we are a very diverse group of people. There are like 600 different languages in Canada. Like there's a bunch of different um, experiences of being indigenous in this, in, just in this country. And uh, it can be a bit of a, a bit, bit of a burden, but you know, I do recognize it as a privilege as well. Yeah. It's always hard to be the, you know, like for me, it'd be like, um, can you speak on behalf of all freckled women everywhere? <laughs> it's like, yeah. I really can't. I, I'm, that's not my job, but yet we, we look to, <laughs> we look to indigenous leaders, black leaders, anyone who doesn't fit the white mainstream bullshit that we've been purporting for so many years. It's like, well, can you speak on behalf of everyone in your community? 
And and when I I was the you know I I don't know if you know this or not but I was the news anchor for APTN so I was literally telling the world Indigenous issues <laughs> and honestly it it got to the point where I was just done like I was exhausted. So you were on Dragon's Den. Yes. You pitched and you you were aired because not everyone who gets pitched gets aired. That's right. What was that experience like after like you did the, the you did the thing. I know there's probably like an NDA and all that associated with it, but tell us about that experience and then sort of the after, the after experience. Because I've shown up on TV once or twice and I know what that's been like, but not at this level. And I'm curious. And also <laughs> preface to that question, what made you, what made you decide to go on Dragon's yes. Den? Yes. Right. Yeah, because I, I really, people have been after me from the get-go. It's like, oh, you should go on Dragon's Den. And uh, at that point I was like, eh, I just, I didn't, um, I don't know. I just, I didn't, it didn't seem like the right thing for me. And then I actually ended up getting a, a friend of mine ended up working for Dragon's Den and said, you know, like, this is basically just a commercial. This is all that this is. People have a perception of Dragon's Den, you know, being all about business and, you know, that, that these, these guys are making these great deals. And if you get on Dragon's Den, you get offered a deal, you're set. But it's not, it's, it's, this is entertainment. Like mm -hmm. this is it's not a reality, reality show. It is a reality show. It's a reality show, which is surreality. <laughs> I love the name reality yes. shows because they're not real at all. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, they're there to build a brand for these dragons as someone who is, you know, supposedly great at business um, to raise their profile. It's there to sell commercials for CBC. Um, it is not there to benefit the entrepreneur. Um, you are, you're the dog and pony show, basically. Um, and if you watch Dragon's Den uh, on the regular, you will see that the deals tend to be very skewed uh, to the dragons. And a lot of things that people don't know as well, which, as you mentioned, you know, only about 60% of the people who uh, at and end up getting shot, like filmed, um, actually make it on the show. <laughs> you always have to, people are not used to television when you say that. Like I went and I shot <laughs> what, somebody shoot over and where yeah, yeah. yeah. filmed um, on camera. <laughs> yeah. Filmed on camera. <laughs> and then the people that say yes uh, to those deals on camera, it doesn't mean that they actually happened in real life. I've heard that rumor. I, I heard something about that. Due diligence and all that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, and this was advice that was given to me by my friend who was a producer. And he said, no matter what the deal is, say yes. Interesting. And I said, what? And he goes, yeah, because only 60% of the people actually make it on the show. So if you have a dragon who thinks you're going to do a deal with them, they're going to push for you to actually make it to air because that's going to have benefit for your business. That makes sense. So mm -hmm. say yes. Um, now. That being said, once you get off air, sign nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and just figure out if it's actually a relationship that you want to have. And if the deal makes sense to you, because having somebody come into your business, especially in an equity position is like worse than a marriage, better than a marriage, deeper than a marriage, because getting divorced is a lot easier than getting rid of somebody shitty in your company. So yeah, that's, that's sort of the deal with Dragon's Den. It's infotainment. Yeah. Did you get a bump? Did you feel a bump in your business or? We did, but not as much as uh, they originally, like when Dragon's Den first came out, everybody was watching it, right? Um, so yeah, we did see a bump and then we again saw a bump on Netflix. But um, later on that, that month, we had a article on an online uh, newspaper called La Presse in Quebec. And we probably did three times what we did uh, in drag for Dragon's Den. Interesting. Day. So interesting. Yeah, we ended up selling like $100,000 in Quebec alone, based on that one article, which blew Dragon's Den away. So it wasn't even really that great of marketing for us anyway. And by the way, I was in there talking to them for about 45 minutes. And, you know, it's, they make you sign an agreement that says that they can manipulate your language to whatever they need to do to tell a story. Called Frank and um, editing, whether it's where true they, or not. Yeah, they take your words and they can hash them together. Your expressions, yeah. you know. Yep. Uh, and that's why I, 
you know, one of the things that my friend had actually said to me is make sure that you always smile because if they take a frown or a, a fa- they could put it anywhere. Resting bitch face is toxic. Resting they can bitch use that face. for so many things. Yeah. And just like, just a lot of it just didn't like they, they, they cut it down to five minutes. Right. So it's not exactly um, the reality of what happened. So, yeah. So when you're sort of reflecting through the lens of decolonizing your business or decolonizing wealth, how does the dragon's den concept of the free, the, you know, the free commercial, how does that, does that change anything or does that, you know, sort of, how does that look? I'm not sure. What, I'm not sure. I, I understand what you mean. I'm not sure either, but it sounds, it sounded a little bit like I was just thinking about what you were saying and how you're reading this deco- decolonizing your business thing. Right. And then I was thinking about sort of this notion that the show kind of serves to uh, benefit the dragons that are sitting on the stage. And then entrepreneurs are brought out to make the dragons look good. And then there's this sort of idea that you need to sort of play the part and play along. And if you say yes to the deal on the show, then it lo- then it's good for everybody. But then behind the scenes, you sort of need to be protecting yourself. And I was just curious, I just sort of started going academic <laughs> off in that, a, different, a different direction in my mind and wondering how that all kind of fits with this other way of looking at, you know, how to, how to build a business and where sort of marketing and reality TV kind of fits into that whole paradigm. It wasn't really a direct question. It was more of a I wonder. Yeah, I mean, it was a free commercial. It was an opportunity to talk a little bit about my product. Um, it was also actually an opportunity to kind of spread the word about there being another option. Um, I did have quite a few people who had said to me, "Oh, I saw you on Dragons and I ordered the product and it worked really great for my daughter." And thank you, you know. So that was that was good for sure. It is what it is, right? It's it's entertainment. It's not reality especially if it gets your product into the hands of people who really need it. Yeah. And we're putting steroids on their baby like I was doing and feeling really crappy about it. Yeah. Like when I started and these, the most of businesses that, um, that I've been having my product in are natural health food stores and like, you know, more high end grocery kind of things, but that's not reaching everyone. And, you know, being on Dragon's Dead is reaching some people maybe who've never heard of my product before. And, you know, launching on other platforms and going into other sort of what's called mass, uh, mass market uh, retailers is going to reach yet another audience. So we're, we're starting to work on that as well. For that person who is thinking, you know, maybe they've been laid off, maybe, you know, COVID has shown them that like, Hey, it's time for a reset. I got to go in a new direction. Cause if that wasn't a wake up call, I don't know what is, what would you say to those people who are thinking about embarking on their own entrepreneurial journey? Do it. Absolutely. Now is the time. I mean, there are programs out there, um, you know, the things that are available for people who want to pivot in their lives, you know, maybe their job has disappeared and they want to try something new. Um, and I think people also are getting the more of the understanding of what is really important in life. Um, like, you know, well, like I said, I, I, I um, supported myself from the get-go, you know, when working at um, farmer's markets. You know, I was not living high on the hog, you know, and I, I still shop at Value Village because I love it. <laughs> it's just fun regardless. Yeah. Yeah. And you think about, but what is important to us, right? It's our community. It's our connections. It's our friendships. It's our health. It's our family. And those things don't cost shit. So do you really need to have a big house and a car and everything else? Or do you want to follow your passion? And I think everybody now is going, yeah, this is, we've been fed a lie that we have to have all these things in our life to be complete. Well, it's just trying to fill up a giant hole. It just gets bigger. Um, So yeah, go for it. Absolutely. And you're like 10 years into it. So we can, we we believe you because (laughs) you're like, this is six months in to be like, all right, she's high on adrenaline, but now you're like a hardened legit 10 year decade long you've done your paces yeah you've earned your stripes and all those things I just think it must feel so good to have your daughter like I loved that story you told about your daughter where she the boys said women or what did they say ladies can't girls can't be the boss and she's like my my mom's the boss of everything yeah you know just even that just must be like some gratifying feedback right there yeah 
it's great. And she knows that she can go out and do anything and be anything. And she doesn't take shit from anybody. And, you know, she just, one of the things that not only does she stand up for herself, but she stands up for other people, which makes me really proud. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's the thing. It's one thing to take a flying leap when you're a single individual with no dependents, but it's another thing when you have one or more little humans depending on you to provide them with food and shelter and all those other essentials. <laughs> and you want to, you know, pursue passion and, and create something amazing. Well, she also motivates me too. Like, I don't know, like maybe I would still be laying on the couch eating like a sleeve of crackers with like peanut butter if she hadn't come along do you know what I mean like (laughs) children focus you and they change their your perspective on life so I I definitely you know I I don't think I would have created this business without her for sure absolutely and what I love is I get to like when my daughter's using this she uses it before bed it's got a deep deep hole in the middle because she (laughs) sticks her her little little finger in there there. as (laughs) far as she can but being able to say like I, I I tell her your story. I'm like, hey, I know who makes this and guess why she made it. And she's like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Versus like whatever weird rando major multinational corporation product being able to say, yeah. And you see this jar, you see the sticker, it says you can refill it so you don't have to make a new jar. And just those real world examples that we create for one another of really cool stuff that it, every it's just like these little shots of inspiration firing all over the place it's really cool i love that yeah i mean you're absolutely right like i'm inspired by people constantly that they're they're just going out there and doing things in a way that hasn't been done before and i think we all you know to a certain extent have had this idea that you know only a certain person can can do something or you know create something or it has to come from a big company like who am i to do this kind of thing and um i don't think i'm any different from anybody else really i just think that i had the opportunity to put the work in Patrice, I, I just want to say thank you so much for being so generous with your time. We know you have so much going on. And I think your story, um, as much as you feel normal, is really inspiring for uh, for other people who are going through sort of relationship ups and downs and still want to take that leap in, and into the business world. So thank you for sharing your, your experience and <laughs> your insights with us. Thank you so much. Anytime, guys. This was a lot of fun. And it's, it's really nice to be able to talk to people who just want to be open and honest and, you know, and imperfect and perfect and all the things, you know, I just think it's, it's nice when people reach out and be honest with each other. I love it. Thank you so much for making the time to listen. We know you have way too much going on. If you can spare a little more time though, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Demarried Life or visit us at demarriedlife.com for all of our episodes articles, and lots of other great ideas for living a post-married life that isn't a total shit show. See you there.